Hello, everyone. Um, I want to welcome you all. On behalf of the Abraham Lincoln Brigade Archives, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. Um, some of you know me because I recognize you, but for those who don't, um, I am Margot Feinberg. I am daughter of an Abraham Lincoln Brigade vet, a longtime union labor lawyer, and a proud supporter of Alba. <clears throat> Uh, my mother, Helen Freeman Feinberg, was a nurse who went to Spain as part of the Abraham Medical Battalion. She was 22 at the time. She'd been active in the nurses' union at Brooklyn Jewish Hospital before leaving for Spain. My mother, as you may know, was a nurse on the front lines in Spain and was injured, nearly losing her arm when the Franco government strafed the tent where they were performing surgery. Hey, Margot, this is Sebastian. You can't hear me? Uh, you can hear you, but you're covering your camera with the paper, I think. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Okay, I'm back. Sorry. Great. The camera was there. Okay. So much for four years of Zoom. Okay, so I apologize. So um, you could hear me, correct? So I will continue. Um, so my mother returned to the United States where she continued to take on challenges to lend her nursing skills to people in need, be it in Ecuador after the Peru-Ecuador border war, serving migrant workers in Oregon, going to Germany after World War II, where she helped people coming out of the camps as part of a program through JOINT, and then returning to the United States, also working with the ILGW Health Clinic in New York, and ultimately as a school nurse working with indigent immigrant children and their families, ensuring they had access to health care. So it seems quite appropriate um, that um, I invoke her name today, a strong working woman <clears throat> and union member, as we're about to hear from Karen Nussbaum and the great work of Nine to Five, raising working women and giving women a voice at work. So I'd like to say also that ALBA's mission is to preserve the legacy of these volunteers <clears throat> who fought fascism in Spain and what an important model as we confront so much here in the United States today. <clears throat> if you are joining our event for the first time, be sure to check out our website for more information. And you'll find links to our website in the chat and be sure to sign up to receive the quarterly publication, The Volunteer. The Sussman Lecture is named in honor of Abraham Lincoln Brigade veteran and co-founder of the Abraham Lincoln Brigade Archives, William, known as Bill Sussman. The series of free lectures has pre presented in-depth material related to the Spanish Civil War and every other topics every year since 1998. We would like to thank the Sussman family for their support, including Helene Sussman, the widow of Bill Sussman, and other members of the family who I believe may be joining us here today. Alba is pleased to offer our programs free of charge, but of course, this is only possible through the generosity of our donors. So please do consider making a donation at the links, which you can find in the chat as well. So I have a few housekeeping matters. This event, as you may have seen, will be recorded. If you prefer not to be seen, you may turn off your camera. There will be an opportunity for questions from the audience. Start thinking about your questions and we will soon invite you to put them in the chat. And when I say soon, I mean, if Please listen to, to Karen. <laughs> and now I am pleased to introduce this year's Sussman Lecture and to thank her for agreeing to participate. And that is Karen Nussbaum. Karen Nussbaum has been an organizer for more than 50 years. She was the founding director of 9 to 5, the National Organization of Working Women, District 9 to 5 SEIU, and Working America, the community organizing arm of the AFL-CIO. Nussbaum served as the director of the U.S. Department of Labor Women's Bureau, the highest seat in the federal government devoted to women. She is the co-author of two books and writes about women, labor, politics, and culture. Nussbaum is on the board of Working America. I hope you've seen the documentary about 9 to 5, now showing on Netflix, and have become familiar with the great work of Working America, which has and will continue to, <clears throat> excuse me, knock on doors and turn out voters to the polls as we face another critical time in our democracy. And so now, Karen Nuss. Thank you, Margot and uh, Alba. Let me see if this works on the screen. Awesome. 
Um, and I see a few friends, uh, and uh, Holly and Anne and Susan and Ellen. How nice of you to be here. Good to see you. Um, last spring, I visited Barcelona with friends. And when I got back, I told my 99-year-old dad about a guided tour I went on that uh, about the Spanish Civil War. Now, my dad is a great guy. He's uh, very well informed, perceptive, uh, but his politics are that of a New Deal Democrat. And so I was very surprised when he went and showed me the latest issue of The Volunteer uh, and told me that when he was a kid, he wanted to go fight in the, in the Spanish Civil War, but he was only 13, so, so he couldn't go. Um, uh, the 1930s was a period of upheaval and inspiring millions of young people, including my dad. Uh, but much of its legacy, as you know, was hidden for the generation of activists like me who came up in the 60s and 70s, another time of upsurge. Well, the world is in upheaval again. And this afternoon, I want to talk briefly about two organizing efforts I've been involved in over the years, 9 to 5 uh, and the working women's organizing of the 70s through the 90s, and more recently, Working America over the last 20 years, and how they inform the way I look at the challenges we have today. Uh, I turned 18 in 1968. I came of age when revolution was in the air. Um, I remember when I first got to on campus uh, as an 18 year old and I saw a study that said that one million students identified as revolutionaries. And I thought that was a lot. So I dropped out of college, of course, and went to Cuba on the second Vince Ramos Brigade. I came back, cut my hair short and got a part time job as a clerical worker. Uh, to support my full-time organizing against the war and for women's liberation. I participated fully in the often anarchic anti-war movement, and maybe you've had similar experiences. Like uh, when we used to call a meeting for the anti-war organization I was in, in Boston, we would announce it on the radio and hundreds of people would come to a planning meeting and it would last for hours. People would be it, huddled in this tiny storefront office that we had. And, you know, we'd make these plans. And then of course, after everybody left, the plans were thrown out and the real plans were made by the actual leaders. But uh, there was no, no rational decision-making in any of it. Uh, I, I don't know if any of you remember those weekend long conferences that we would have on a campus someplace to organize the anti-war movement, which were always highlighted by the, um, the drug infused wild parties on the Saturday night uh, that you could hardly believe that you recovered on, from for the Sunday proceedings. And there were also some party formations in those years, like PL that created their own chaos. I remember a meeting that we had where we're doing our business and three or four people from PL come in and they uh, disrupt the meeting. They stop the meeting because they want to take issue with us on a leaflet that we had in which we quoted President Eisenhower, who said that if elections had been held in Vietnam in 1954, Ho Chi Minh would have won. And the problem was that we were um, legitimizing Eisenhower. So <laughs> these were, this is how we carried on our business. Max Elbaum in his book, Revolution in the Air, has a chapter devoted to that particular dynamic that I just described, which he entitles Elaborate Doctrine, Weak Class Anchor. Now there were of course, uh, experienced leftists in, in the peace movement um, who had come out of the left, uh, but we suffered from the, the gap that was created by the repression of the left. Uh, where was a rational structure? How could you make decisions that were strategic and accountable? How could you be a leftist with a mass strategy in practice and not just in theory? Uh, those were the questions that we didn't even know how to ask at that time, but were really plaguing us. So we did our best to figure it out as we went along and we did help end the war, thank heavens. 
Um, and soon I realized that I could organize on my job. Not a union at first, more like a community organization in the workplace, uh, because that's the more of the uh, model that we knew. So we gathered 10 friends who were all working as clerical workers in different workplaces, a factory, a insurance company, a hospital. Um, uh, and we put together newsletters and surveys and leaflets and did uh, actions. But I knew we were onto something when we got a letter into our newsletter from a woman named Joyce Weston. And in it, she said, I'll be called girl till the day I retire without pension. And in those 10 words, she captured, captured the major contradictions. So we rode the wave of uh, the women's movement, of the demand for women's rights. And we built a new front in the women's movement. Now, luckily I got a job as a clerical worker and instead of something more uh, minor because uh, I was in the most important sector with unique advantages. It was the biggest job for women. One out of three women worked as a clerical worker. There were 20 million women office workers, people who had been invisible. You know, the, if you'd asked somebody what was the most uh, common job in America, they would have told you it was a man in a hard hat, but it was really a woman at a keyboard. Um, uh, women's jobs were so limited in those days that uh, women uh, ac across class and race found themselves in the same workplaces, which was also a unique advantage. Uh, and so women who were middle class and working class, black and white, found themselves together with common demands. And I think our organizing took off because we were in that sector, but we employed these uh, uh, four key strategies. The first was that we broadened the appeal of the women's movement. We took the women's movement and then took it further. You know, we didn't call our organization Working Women of the World Unite. We called it Nine to Five. You know, it was very anodyne. It wasn't a struggle in the name. Uh, but there was the seeds of identification of workers for women who had not really identified as workers. Um, we didn't use the word feminist. Uh, I can't tell you the number of women who walked into the organization saying, I'm no women's liver, but I should be paid what the men are paid. I should have an opportunity for advancement. Uh, I should be treated with respect. Well, that's what a feminist was, but um, they weren't going for the title, they were going for the content. We didn't even use the word organized because people didn't know what we were talking about. You know, it's like, like organize your closet. It just wasn't part of the way they thought about their lives. Um, so there was a, and we used to say in those days, or think that, you know, don't let your words be the enemy of your ideas. Uh, and then the, the other part of this was using the media, which was willing to let us do and say and promote anything. We, if we could take a dozen or 15 people to some bad boss and pick it outside of his office at noon and call the press, well, we'd be all over the news by five o'clock. Uh, and that helped popularize and normalize what we were doing. Secondly, we took advantage both of the momentum, but we also knew we had to build um, a, a strong institutional base. And so we had a union strategy and it was, there, was, there was always an association and a union strategy from the beginning. Um, and we built SEIU uh, nine to five, the, our union within SEIU. We were conscious from the beginning about making alliances across class and race. And we did it very concretely that we would always have two co-chairs and we would have two people speak at the event. And, and then we would always combine working class and middle class, black and white, older and younger, so that people became friends and they became comrades in a struggle that they were just developing their own language for. And lastly, we were clear about the enemy. The enemy was the boss and it was corporate power. It wasn't 
you know, government agencies that weren't doing their job. It wasn't men in general. Uh, we, you had to be clear about who the, the enemy was. And while we weren't targeting men in general, I do have to say there were plenty of divorces that came out of nine to five as well. It was a byproduct, but it wasn't the part of the objectives. The Dolly Parton nine to five song captured both the, the um, it, it's a perfect example of the message and the way we've delivered it. And if you think about the song, she goes through a few uh, uh, verses, the, the struggle, the entire struggle. And it starts with uh, the working woman's aspiration, uh, you know, stumble in the kitchen, pour myself a cup of ambition. So you want more out of your life. It moves to grievance. Uh, they never give you credit. Uh, and then it goes to class conflict where she says, you're just a step on the boss man's ladder. And then she wraps it all up with collective power when she says we're in the same boat. So it's a genius song that you wouldn't, uh, you know, accuse of being didactic, uh, but is great in its analysis. Now, the song was great, but of course, the, the 9 to 5 movie was a really big thing. You know, not that many movements have a whole movie that is the number two box office hit of the year, only outdone by uh, Star Wars or something. The Empire Strikes Back, I think it was. Um, I had known Jane and Holly during our work together at the Indochina Peace Campaign, Jane Fonda, and kept her involved in the uh, work that we were doing, organizing clerical workers. And it was her idea to make a movie um, because she knew from us that there was you know, ma a massive audience that had never been addressed. And of course, uh, it was a huge hit. Um, and then we took the movie and I went on a 20 city tour right afterwards called the movement behind the movie. And we created a dozen new chapters um, so that we really brought together culture and organizing in a wildly successful way. We had really big gains. We, you know, won millions of dollars in back pay, victories uh, uh, for unions all around the country, policy changes. Um, we changed the consciousness of millions of women and uh, developed hundreds or maybe thousands of organizers who then went on to transform the labor movement. And there were, and it wasn't just us. There was lots of working women organizing going on. There was stewardesses for women's rights. There were coal mining women. There were sex workers had an organization called Coyote. Uh, Call off your old tired ethics was the name of their organization. Uh, out in California. Um, but despite all of that, we got smashed in the 80s and the 90s. We were crushed um, in a lot of different ways. Employers decided, okay, we've had enough of this turmoil, and they they created a safety valve. They broke, they broke the class alliance between middle class and working class women, and they gave college-educated women middle class, upper middle class, an opportunity to become managers and professionals. Um, and they restructured the workforce. Uh, there was the backlash to the women's movement uh, led by Phyllis Schlafly, who herself was an ideological right winger, but cleverly used the smokescreen of culture wars to advance their agenda and break the, the power of the women's movement. And there was an assault on unions that... Uh, we're all familiar with. But for us at nine to five, it was almost poetic. We announced the expansion of our union <clears throat> uh, to a national jurisdiction to be able to organize all around the country in the very same week that Reagan fired the air traffic controllers. So here we are thinking the future is before us when in fact the ceiling was coming in on us. Uh, and it wasn't just us, of course, that got smashed. It was, you know, nearly every element of the left and working people. We didn't recognize the growing power of a sustained right-wing agenda that had been started under Nixon and cemented under Reagan and continues today. Uh, and we didn't see that the Democrats were no longer a reliable ally, that they had they were as dependent 
uh, on corporate money as the Republicans were starting in about the 90s and, and up to today. We could have been smarter in those days. I don't know that we could have been stronger. Um, I think we just got outdone. But by the late 1990s, public opinion was beginning to change again. There was a, a opinion turning against global capitalism. I don't know if you guys remember the um, WTO, protest, the WTO protests in Seattle in 1999, where we had uh, uh, Teamsters and Turtles together forever. It was like a great uh, mashup of movements and a new clear direction. But again, we it got that momentum got taken out by Bush stealing the election from Gore, by 9-11 and the war on terror and the rise of the religious right. So within a few years inside the AFL-CIO, we saw both a, a desperate need and an opportunity that white workers especially were being sheared off by a right-wing agenda, a largely a social agenda in those days. And we had to convince them that it was worthwhile to fight for jobs and democracy, that they weren't throwing their vote away uh, instead of voting on guns, God, and gays, which is what they were doing at the time. Uh, but instead of riding a wave in doing this kind of organizing, as we did in the 70s, we were against the tide. There was no momentum on our side. We had to reach people one by one. Uh, so we set out to do that, and we created Working America as the community affiliate of the AFL-CIO. We went door to door in working class communities, knocking on every door except the doors where union members lived because they had an organization. Um, in states like Ohio, to start a conversation. Um, and and these conversations took place with people where usually Fox News is on the TV on the other side of the screen. Um, and uh, to, to do that one by one painstakingly and to literally open a door to people who we couldn't reach any other way. And here's how it, uh, the conversation would go. Hi, I'm Karen from Working America. We're part of the AFL-CIO. Um, what's the most important thing to you today, you know, most important issue for you and your family? And, you know, among the, you know, healthcare, education, jobs, retirement, corporate accountability, and that, oh, healthcare is your most important issue. Well, you know, the problem is that big corporations have way too much power. The solution is strength in numbers, join today, and we can have our voices heard in a different way if you sign up and become a member take an action, you can sign a petition right now uh, to expand Medicaid in your state, um, uh, and, you know, and, and thank you and uh, we'll stay in touch. Well, we do stay in touch because by that little interaction, we now know their email address, their phone, their address. We know what their most important issue is. We, we later know how they voted in the past. We know if they've got family members, uh, uh, we start, uh, we know that they've taken an action and all of this is information that we then use to stay in touch with them on the things they care about in the ways that they want to be reached. Two out of three people we talk to sign up and become a member with that con kind of conversation. We organized a million members in our first year. It was a massive undertaking. We have 4 million members today. They're not in, uh, union members, they are their neighbors. They're working class, a third of them are gun owners, two thirds of them have family incomes under $75,000 a year. 80% don't have a college education. 90% are not in anybody else's organization on the left. Uh, we, we are reaching the people that everybody thinks you can't reach. Um, and testing, and we do a ton of testing to make sure that we what we do works, shows what every organizer knows or at least hopes, and that is that membership matters. Um, now, being a member of 9 to 5 is uh, 9 to 5 working America, and sometimes we say working America is 9 to 5 with men, but uh, that uh, being a member of working America is not nearly as engaging, obviously, as being a union member. But it 
makes a huge difference. Our members are far more likely to vote for our endorsed candidates, to take an action, to change their minds, uh, and even on issues around race and sex from, from a distance. <clears throat> I want to tell you the, uh, the story of a little interaction I had last summer. I was in Philadelphia. I had to take a cab, and um, I'm talking to the cab driver about his industry and how Uber's just, you know, destroying them and how he can't make a living. And we're having a whole conversation. And I say something about working America and he stops the car and pulls it over. And he says, I know working America. And he pulls out his phone and he shows me the texts that he's been getting from working America. Well, we have an office in Philadelphia and someone went to his door and signed him up. And now he's getting texts. I don't know if he reads the text, but he didn't, you know, say stop. And he identifies with working American. It means that when we go back and say, well, you, Joseph, you told us good jobs was your most important issue. Let me tell you where the candidates stand. He's going to listen. And when, when I got out of the car, he says to me, my name is Joseph. You know, he he wanted to be seen and he wanted to be heard. And that is so much of what's going on uh, with these people that that so desperately need to be brought into our movement. So we're in another period of political chaos now, the 30s, the 70s, and now today. We've got a swell of social movements. We've got a revived labor movement that's uh, with passionate organizing like Starbucks and, and uh, Amazon and strategic bargaining and strikes with like UPS and the UAW and teachers and Kaiser and so many awesome, inspiring strikes. <clears throat> and now what we need is strategic organizing. Um, but We've got massive problems too. Obviously, we've got structural obstacles for the labor movement that make it almost impossible to win a union election uh, and get certified for bargaining. We've got the worst labor code in the West, in the Western world. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, we've <clears throat> we've got social movements. I'm sorry. I've had a cold for seven weeks. I don't know if you've had this cold. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, we've got social movements that are <clears throat> not using their strength as a <clears throat> springboard but are going into a rabbit hole. Uh, instead of expanding out, they're turning in. Um, you know, and then we've got, we are getting out organized, especially at the local level with disastrous consequences. And that's to say nothing of the wars, the climate catastrophe and the normalized far right that we have to contend with. My own view of how to navigate this is that we've got to win the 2024 elections, that it's a priority. That we've got to rebuild the labor movement. Um, and that we need it to win and we need it to govern. <clears throat> and that we, <clears throat> uh, that we find common ground on economic issues. I want to end by going back to the 1930s in Vivian Gornick's book, The Romance of American Communism, she interviews 50 people and they are, you know, very critical and they've got a litany of, of the problems. But there was a consensus almost of so many of them felt that this was the most important period of their life. And they pointed to, and these were their words, the, being, the importance of being in a movement that had vision and discipline. Now, those are two things I think we could use a lot more of. And I would add one more. Uh, I talked with a, an, a local organizer, a, 
union organizer who told me that she thought what we needed was more organizations where people take minutes, you know, where there's a, you, there's a structure and people are responsible. And as a member, you, you know, vote for your leader and you vote on the budget and you, uh, you know, vote on your contract and you pass the damn minutes, you know, you, that, that there, you bring people together and you bind them. Uh, through your structure. Um, the, I think that uh, we need those things, the vision, the discipline, and the, and the, the structure, the, the organizations with minutes um, to, uh, uh, to, to accomplish what we need to. And from a, a lifetime of organizing, I know you can organize working people across class and race. Uh, I know you can do it under conditions that are good and under bad conditions that you can touch the incipient anger at capitalist excess and reawaken a belief in collective action. We'll need all that, uh, and, you know, and passing the minutes to, to prevail in the next period. So thank you very much for your time and uh, sharing these uh, uh, this opportunity for me to share these few thoughts. Okay, I think we're gonna open it to questions, but I'm gonna take the privilege, right, of the my role here to ask you the first one, Karen, if that's okay. And actually I'm gonna start with sort of where you're ending, which is about working for America I don't know about the minutes, but I do believe that organizing does require accountability and um, that if, if it could be minutes, but it should be uh, confirming who you've spoken to, when you spoke to them, did you call them again, did you remind them? So I'm all for that. Um, and But you indicated that there are um, something like 4 million workers that Working for America had contacted. And I'm sure that there is a plan for 2024. So I was wondering if you could share a little bit about who and how we will reach those 4 million and also how we will identify the next uh, 4 million or whatever number that is um, to impact 2024. And if uh, you could also share if the people on this Zoom or the people they know could get involved, how they too, because I understand Working for America is a volunteer organization and I know the labor movement and they themselves are alone can't do all of that. So could you tell us a little bit about the vision for moving forward? Thank you. Thank you, Margo. Um, so Working America actually has talked to 12 million people and we have 4 million members. And those are people that we know how to contact and we're, we're in contact with them all the time. Um, and uh, we're, all, we're out there having millions more conversations this year going into the 2024 elections. And those conversations are all about issues. We don't talk about elections because people hate politics, especially the people we talk to who aren't yet polarized. You know, they're not on one side or the other. They're just trying to figure out how to pay the rent. Um, and so, you know, there are people like Joseph who want to feel like someone has their back uh, and that it's worth getting a little bit involved. Uh, so we've got... Um, the best organizers in the country out there every single night talking to voters. Um, they'll reach millions in battleground states where they're talking specifically to the people that we know are most likely to be persuaded. Uh, as over the years, we found we started with a focus, big focus on white working class, but over the last several years, we found that black voters and Latino voters uh, also are either discouraged and don't want to go out to vote or are uh, trending more conservative. Uh, and they are uh, equally important to reach as persuadable voters, not turnout voters. These are people who have to be convinced of something again. Uh, and so we we're, we're, um, have a big emphasis. About a third of our members are people of color and two thirds are, are white working class. But there is an opportunity to volunteer. We've got a big, big volunteer operation. Um, uh, you know, me and six of my friends run this volunteer operation for Working America. Thousands and thousands of people participate. 
we send letters. They are the most effective uh, letters out there. Again, they're all about issues. We find that just talking about issues is far more effective than mentioning a candidate's name. Anyway, we'd love to have you participate. I'm sure my contact information, I hope my contact information will be available or else you can go to workingamerica.org. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both for, for that. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Dennis Meany. I am the executive assistant here at the Abraham Lincoln Brigade Archive. Um, I've just uh, been, I'm, I'm monitoring your questions in the chat. And so the way in which we usually handle this is um, I'm, I'm, I am uh, cataloging your questions and um, I will call on you here and you have the ability to ask uh, Karen and Margo here your questions, your questions yourselves. So I'll call on you and you, I'll, you'll be allowed to unmute and ask your questions uh, to, to, the, to the lecture here. And um, if you don't feel comfortable doing that, don't feel comfortable doing it on camera, asking the question answer yourself, that's totally fine. I will ask the question instead. Um, I think, well, I, I think we can start with, um, I do have a question here from Holly Near. Holly Near, if you'd like to ask your question, you can go ahead and do so now. Hey, Karen, that was wonderful. It's so great to see you. And I think we met back during the Indochina Peace Campaign tours and um, yep. just such a delight. And so moved to hear what you've been up to, even though I've, seen it out of the corner of my eye. Um, really fantastic organizing. So I just wanted to ask which cultural identity groups seem the most eager to work with one another versus those who are more energized by identity politics, which was a big um, era, I think, where people were organizing by their individual identities, with GLBTQ communities and Black communities, Latino communities. And which of those groups seem very eager now to come together and work together uh, from your point of view? I, well, what do you think, Holly? I'm, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I think that people bring their identities to their activism or their their lives. And in working America, for example, um, our staff is a majority of people of color and they go off and out into white neighborhoods. And, uh, you know, there's sometimes they encounter racism. Sometimes they have, you know, eye-opening conversations with people who otherwise would never talk to a black person and about things that are really important to them. Um, so as we try to create that space as you know for individuals to interact and to break down the barriers in practice um it's we don't experience that very much as formations or organizations coming together i don't know if that's responsive sure um i think as a an artist, I find myself not identifying with political organizations or parties because one person might come wanting to hear a song maybe about feminism or about lesbianism, and then they learn about the military industrial complex. Another might come in who's anti-war and they'd learn something about <clears throat> what it is to be a family that has a transgender student. So by not <clears throat> hooking up with one particular issue, I found that people might come in <clears throat> to the into the audience, into the conversation with one thing in mind, but their consciousness is expanded by being with people who are from um, multiple um, interests and energies. And I just was just curious to know if that was working also in your organization where, because you're talking about work as opposed to cultural identity, it, it's a common ground that a lot of different people can. And that's exactly, what we're what we're doing and we were very surprised we did a, a study this year and there's normally a bias uh, that people um, when people are voting um, members of the public when they vote will typically uh, be less likely to vote for people of color or women candidates when they're up against white male candidates but if you're a working america member that bias goes away now and that's because they've 
they're focused on the common economic issues and that when you can find common ground, you can let go of who you've been blaming otherwise. And we find that in the conversations at the door all the time. Yeah, thanks. Great work, it's really exciting. Thanks. Thank, thank you, Holly. Um, okay, I, uh, I believe we can, I have another question uh, that uh, actually, we have a question from the chair of ALBA here, Sebastian Faber, if you'd like to ask your question, I believe you can do so now. Uh, thank you, Dennis. I want to take this moment to congratulate Dennis, who celebrated his fourth year anniversary yesterday with ALBA. Thank you, Dennis, for all your hard work. Four more we years. do yeah. this without you. Uh, but I, I, I do have a, have a question for Karen. Uh, thank you for taking it, Dennis. <laughs> um, Karen, um, you mentioned, uh, you said sort of in passing that you find that social movements are going into a rabbit hole. And you also mentioned that you think we are being, the left is being out-organized and, and kind of outsmarted, I think you, you implied, by the right and have been for, for a long time. Um, combining those two ideas, could you say something about tactics or strategy for that matter? And are there things that the left can learn from the successes of the right? Tactics to be copied, strategies to be copied? Does the right have that vision and discipline that the left still is missing in your view? Um, I think the right has been uh, brilliant about how they've pursued their agenda since the uh, since the Cold War. Um, you know, they had a, a, a huge defeat with Barry Goldwater, and they have been on a path ever since then that we didn't we didn't notice or we thought was marginal, and it turned out to be wildly effective. Uh, but and they are also like rich people are richer than you could ever have imagined they could be. So the resources are phenomenal. While in the meantime, we have just let our resources, which is the organization of people, die out. Um, you know, how could it, how could it, this may feel narrow, but how could democratic majorities fail to pass labor law reform in the 70s and in the 90s and under Obama when unions are like the biggest multiracial cross-class organizations of people that generate their own money? You know, they are funded by people. They're, other than churches, we don't have very much of that going on on our side. Um, so we neglected our strengths. We got, uh, we uh, ridiculed our opponents uh, and we got swept away by uh, world events in a way that was, you know, dumb. Uh, and now we're <laughs> faced with a climate crisis, um, uh, you know, a, a a difference in income that is staggering. I don't know how we find the resources to do what we do. Um, uh, and, and pretty poor strategy. You know, I think at this point we need to both build our base and it has to be painstaking and it has to be sophisticated at the same time. It has to be a combination of one-on-one -on -one human organizing reinforced by the most sophisticated data and communications that we can bring to bear. Uh, and we have to be much better, smarter about exploiting uh, crises uh, because it, that is our only opportunity, to, I think, to turn things around in a major way in the period coming up. And there's gonna be plenty of crises for us to do that. I don't know if that is responsive, Sebastian, but uh, you know, and, uh, and the part about expansive, uh, expansive or, or uh, narrowing, um uh you know uh, the uh, I, the importance of of identity politics is great the what i the what's come out and what we've all learned over the last period from that kind of struggle that's been that's characterized the last 5 years has been essential and overdue and uh it, i'm great uh, i'm grateful for it that's not the point but uh, extremely important. But how do we use that as a strategy? How do we advance that while 
having a mass strategy. You got to be able to do both. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sebastian. Um, okay, I think we can go now to a question from Susan Sation. Sation, you can ask your question now if you feel comfortable doing so. You should be able to unmute. Thank you so much, Karen, Margo. Oh my gosh, there's so many of my heroes on this. I just could be on with you all day. Um, Karen, uh, your work is amazing. And I know like California's Central Valley, you know, going down, you've done some great work there. Um, was privileged to really always walk in areas and work with Fran. Fran. But anyway, my question was, we had talked one time about the connections that you get like identify a sector that they work in, like construction or retail or healthcare or whatever. Um, just a broader question is, have you ever, how have you thought about organizing workers in sectors where there really isn't a chance of getting a contract or building, you know, just a um, an identity with one employer because they're just so big, especially in some geographic areas? Um, yeah, and uh, Susan, a phenomenal organi labor organizer, uh, coming up at the same time I did. Uh, thank you for being here, Susan. Um, yeah, I think, for example, the work that SEIU did in organizing the fast food workers in California is a is the best we've seen of anything and opens the door to new kinds of organizing. I think the challenge is how do you um, uh, and and you know, that organizing was uh, putting pressure on employers to agree to a tripartite bargaining table of workers, employers, and government to set wages and some uh, standards for work. But how do you create governance and membership uh, and, um, uh, you know, accountability, as Margot says, um, so that the workers own the the advances, because otherwise it'll end up being just like minimum wage fights. You know, you have a big fight in a city and uh, you pass an ordinance and you've got a higher minimum wage and workers think that, you know, you get higher wages because government gives you higher wages. Um, it's not a it's not a way to build worker power. So, I mean, SEIU, awesome organization. They'll figure it out. But, but how do you. Uh, use um, uh, identity as a group of workers, um, combine that with advances, and then turn that back into organizational structure uh, where workers help pay for their organization and run their organization. It's not going to look like traditional unions, but you've, I think those are the elements that you have to have. Yeah, thank you. And and just a, a quick note, Holly, we were working on the Farm Workers Boycott way, way back, went to your concert, you did shout outs for the boycott, but one, a young woman in our house, a four, she's a children of a farm worker in the fourth grade, saying no more genocide in my name in her fourth grade talent show. <laughs> we, she came home and said, that's what I, I want to sing. Can you all help me? We said, oh, that's so great. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Uh, I think we can do a few more. Um, uh, Sandy Polishek, I believe you had a question lined up. You can ask it now if you if you so choose. Hi. <clears throat> yes, I'm I'm interested in I'm in Oregon. I'm interested in knowing if you have local um locals that people can get involved with or um do you have to wait until somebody knocks on your door which may never happen um sandy we actually started in we organized in oregon for years when oregon was um purple you know before it became all blue and i think we had a hand in that but um the the best way for for folks uh unless you're in the handful of states which are battleground states where we're doing on the ground organizing is to become a Work America volunteer and we'll get information out to you. We'd love to have you participate. We have a lot of fun. Thank you, Sandy. Um, okay, I think maybe I'm seeing a question here in the chat from uh, uh, a little legend around, around these parts. Um, 
Uh, Mr. Peter Carroll, Chair Emeritus of ALBA, I think you had a question for Karen here. You can ask it if you like. Yeah, um, I, I'm interested in uh, money, funding, funding, and uh, and how that works. And if if there was a way that people can um, channel donations, I don't mean just in general things, but very specifically about the upcoming elections in 2024. What what do you need, and how do you think you're going to get it? Um, we're supported partly by labor. We're also supported by um, people who uh, want to win the elections. And we're also supported, though, at members uh, pay dues. Not uh, It's not required, but we do have members who pay dues. Um, because so much of our work is about issues and it's only about elections in the last couple of months of any year, we take uh, C3 contributions as well as C C4, C5 contributions. So um, uh, support from individuals is extraordinarily important. Um, you know, it's like we're the best kept secret. Like none of you heard of Working America before you got on this call, right? Um, but we're the biggest organization out there. We run the best field operation in the country. I mean, this is not just me saying it. It's these outside experts who verify this. Um, and we would love to have you engaged and interested and supported, uh, supportive, but um, that's that's a big part of, of uh, how we keep this going. You know, it's like folks aren't that interested in, anyway, whatever. We'd love to have your interest and support. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. I think we have, we'll probably do one more since we're getting up on the hour here. Again, thank you everybody for coming. Um, I'm just going to go call on, on Richard Burmack, if you'd like to ask. I know you left something in the chat there. If you'd like to ask and ask your question, you can go ahead and do so now. Yeah, so this is very, very inspiring. And I've always been a big fan of, of 9 to 5. And it brings back those times I was involved both in SEIU and local Local 29 organizing office workers in the 70s around blue, a blue cross strike. And it was all very much like, like you said, in, in that then the movement was crushed by, they promoted people into management, as well as I think the fact that then it went from the, the clerical factory to personal computers. But what I really want to ask you, uh, working with ALBA, and I know you're a very pragmatic person, but a little bit about what should ALBA's goal be in, the, in, in this? I mean, we hold sort of a memory and what do these young people sort of need to hear from us about that historical memory? I mean, we fought both for against fascism, but also to preserve democracy of the Spanish Republic and social services, women's rights, which we, we sort of like to stress even more at times that contribution than the war. But anyway, what can you tell us? What's our goal? I mean. You know, a year, years ago, I went to Italy. I mean, this is a long time ago, uh, a meeting with labor uh, people, women's labor leaders in, in Italy. And they kept asking me about fascism. And I kept thinking, what? You know, and I, uh, it felt so remote to me as an American. And it felt so present to them as Italians. And, you know, it's present to us as Americans now. I feel like the role of ALBA is, uh, you know, more urgent than ever. And that there's an audience for a discussion about how do you respond to fascism? How do you respond to the rise of the right? How do you take away the normality of the kind of the normalizing of the far right? Uh, and the, the, the work that ALBA can do in, uh, curricula and events and engaging with campuses and students and uh, organizations is really hard and, and important. And it's around this, what does it mean when fascism is present? Uh, and how do we learn how to respond to that? And it, it, what was so important to the people who were fighting it, you know, uh, over time? I mean, it's a it's a glorious thing to be able to fight the kind of fight that everybody on this call engages in. And how do you help other people feel that and, and do that too? 
Thank you. Thank you, Rich, and thank you, Karen, on that. Um, so yeah, I think that sort of comes up on time for us. So again, thank you everybody for coming. I'm gonna go kick it over right now to Sebastian Faber, um, our chair for kind of some closing sentences. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dennis, and thank you everyone for coming and for supporting us and for supporting Karen and her work. Uh, I completely agree with Richard. It was incredibly inspiring and and uplifting, um, and 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 educational. Um, I want to just say a couple of make a couple of announcements. The first announcement is in fact uh, directly related to what Karen just said. Karen has generously and graciously agreed to join ABBA's honorary board. We have a regular board of governors, and we have an honorary board of governors. And Karen will be joining that honorary board, um, uh, which has folks on it like Robin Kelly, Adam Hochschild, um, uh, Jeff Chang, um, Joyce Horman, um, John Sales, uh, Emilio Silva, Brian Stevenson. So it's a, an honor for us to have somebody of Karen's stature and, and record uh, joining us there. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is that on December 9th, we'll have our first real in-person event since the pandemic. Um, in New York City, uh, right below the Alba office on West 14th Street in the uh, the building of the Spanish Beloved Society, doors open at noon and the show starts at 1230. And this show is um, the show called George and Ruth Songs and Letters from the Spanish Civil War, written by Dan and Molly Watt, based on the letters that George Watt and his uh, wife wrote to each other from Spain and, and back to the US. Uh, it's a beautiful show with uh, two young actors playing the roles of George and, and Ruth and with uh, live music um, interspersed singing the songs that we all know and love. So if you're in New York City or close by to it and you can make it, uh, there's a link in the chat to uh, get a ticket for that event. Um, it'll be catered with proper Spanish food by uh, the great restaurant La Nacional, which is right below there. Um, then we have another event coming up, a labor-themed event on January 25th. You can't get tickets for it yet, but save the date. January 25th at 4 p.m., we're going to talk about Art Shields. And this is a, a the labor journalist um, who was in Spain as well and imprisoned briefly by the Franco forces. This, is, this great event will be hosted by... Uh, um, Josie Yurek and Nancy Wallach. Um, so that's going to be on January 25th. The December issue of The Volunteer is about to go to the printer. If you don't receive it yet in hard copy, uh, email Dennis or in, email info at albavalve.org to sign up for the mailing list. This December issue will feature an interview with Karen and her father, Mike Nussbaum, who, uh, as she explained at the beginning, um, pointed our existence out to her and the existence of the volunteers. So I thought it would be appropriate to feature Karen and her dad in the issue, in the December issue. I think that's all I wanted to share with you today. Thank you again for coming. It was really great to see you all. I uh, see, hope to see you all soon. And thank you so much, Karen and Margot, for this amazing event. Um, it's really, really, really great to be able to host this. Thank you. Thank you.